Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and this week I'm thrilled to introduce to you yet another male survivor who has been speaking out. After saying just a short while ago that there needs to be more men willing to step up and expose the criminal cabal trafficking and abusing our children, I began meeting male survivors suddenly who reached out via email as well as discovering them on other podcasts. This week's guest has an incredible story and I'm honored he chose to share with us on the show. Introducing operational CIA monarch mind slave, overcomer, blogger, husband, father, whistleblower, and walking miracle, J.R. Sweet. Like many survivors you've heard on the show, J.R. lived his conscious life believing he grew up in a normal household environment with a pretty normal family. What J.R. would soon come to find out as an adult in 2017 when he began having memory recall completely shook his world in discovering the narrative he had always told himself about his family couldn't be further from the truth. J.R. grew up in a multi-generational ancestral satanic and Mormon family bloodline whose lineages actually trace back to King Henry VIII, and he didn't begin to recall his and his family's involvement with the CIA's MKUltra mind control program until he was 38. Without giving too much away, I will say that if you are familiar with former podcast guest Kathy O'Brien's story, you will see a lot of parallels that run through JR's testimony as well. Since awakening to his abuse and the truth about his family, he began an incredible blog titled The Mormon Monarch, where he shares harrowing details about his life and past. I highly recommend you guys check his blog out. If you head to www.mormonmonarch.com, I'll have this listed in the show notes and really encourage you all to go support JR's work. JR's story is jam-packed with information, and I also suggest you grab a pen and paper and shut off whatever you're doing and give him your full attention. The amount of courage it takes for a survivor of these horrific atrocities to come forth and speak their truth cannot be understated. And with the stigma around men and abuse, we really need to show our support and stand behind and next to the men who are willing to be on the forefront of exposing these crimes against children while breaking general abuse cycles and stigmas. JR, in this sense, is a hero. Before I finish introducing our guest, I want to give a reminder that if you are a survivor or whistleblower who wants to share your testimony on the podcast or who wants to share any information privately with me, you can now email me at imagineabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. Please send me a briefing of who you are and how I can support you, whether it's through podcasting or sharing information. I also just started a Substack that you can support as well at www.emmacatherine.substack.com. Here, I will be doing weekly recaps and insights on all of my podcasts and using this as a place to publicly journal my journey as an advocate for our children. All my social email and project links can also be found in the show notes. And as always, I'm so grateful for all of your support. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming this week's guest of honor, monarch survivor, voice for the voiceless, advocate for our children, and generational circuit breaker, J.R. Sweet. J.R., thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate yeah, it's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's good to get the message out to the people on what's going on. So I appreciate it. I know, and I appreciate you. I know that these these topics can be very triggering and they're very hard to talk about. And people like you hand off the torch to other people who see your light, and then it gives them courage to talk. So it's not easy being on the forefront of this. And I really do appreciate that you were and are willing to talk about this, because I know it's so hard and stressful on you also. 
Um, so I'd love to actually hear and maybe let's talk to the guests about why did you start speaking out? You know, we'll get into your story, but what was your inspiration for actually wanting to go public with all of this information? Because I'm sure you had a lot to lose. I'm sure you were targeted. I'm sure that it hasn't been the easiest thing for you to come out and talk about this publicly. And I, I'd love to hear your inspiration behind your mission. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It hasn't been very easy and I have lost a lot um, of in that sense. Uh, when I remembered uh, uh, things that I was remembering about my past, um, I was living in Idaho at that time. I was raised in uh, around Idaho, in Idaho and in Salt Lake, uh, born in Oregon, and so all over the West. And in 2017, when I started to remember things, um, it was, I realized I was not in a good situation where I lived. Um, and so I had to, to move and leave Idaho. That was in 2020. But you did a really good introduction. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start where um, with my family, with, with where I come from um, and how I came to be here. And so the reason that I'm speaking out is because because the things that I began to remember in 2017 were so awful and so overwhelming uh, in, in what I was remembering had happened in my life that I felt compelled to speak out. It, it seems inevitable that if you have any kind of a moral standing, you would speak out on these things. It's just how it, how it should be. Um, they have killed me before through monarch programming, and that was for suicide programming. And so I I was dead for, for a short period, and I went to the other side. And I feel like that impacts my reasoning for speaking out as well, because I know that when we leave this earth, we go somewhere, somewhere much more beautiful and wonderful than this place, and we'll see a lot of the folks we knew in this life. And so uh, to me, it, it's, an, it's a message that just needs to be shared. But I come from, I, I am a survivor of the Central Intelligence Agency's trauma-based mind control program. I was raised in a generationally abusive family, a satanic family bloodline, essentially. My family reaches back, as you mentioned, to King Henry VIII. And... And that's something my family was always proud of, that I was always aware of uh, throughout my life. Ever, they always talked about it and were proud of that fact. Um, and my grandfather, uh, that's really where I feel like the Central Intelligence Agency comes into my life is through my grandfather and through my uncle and handler. And my grandfather, he, he was a Marine in World War II. And... He became involved while he was in the Marine Corps uh, with, with various individuals uh, involved with uh, things revolving around the mind. They would use him for various things such as carrying messages. He worked for a colonel for a while. And so he was a courier, he would carry messages and he'd be made to memorize them. And my grandfather was abused as a child. Uh, in my mind, that's how I perceive it. And that's partly what was wrong with him. He ran away when he was 13 years old. And so he had a pretty rough go of life. And then the war on top of that, he was a Marine Corps scout sniper. Um, and so it was pretty hard on him. But after the war, he survived the war and he, he joined, uh, he worked for the Union Pacific Railroad. The Union Pacific Railroad has a history of of nefarious deeds within the, the upper echelon of that company. You can find that research uh, in various books. Um, but he worked for Union Pacific. And in that time, he would, in his own journaling, he talks about being at Union Pacific and a group of uh, well-dressed suits coming in. Uh, he'd been called into the corporate office and they wanted to talk to him. and. I believe that something happened at that time where he was pulled back into the military in some way. 
And he was involved with the Central Intelligence Agency and the Monarch program for quite a ways back. I'm not exactly sure how far back, Emma, but it goes back a long way. And he knew such people as um, Walt Disney, for example, who was connected to Monarch programming and trauma-based mind control. Um, and so my grandfather brought it into the family, in my mind. My grandfather also played the role. This is a little strange and hard for people to get their head around, but we only know what we're told. And so if, for example, someone dies in the media, do you really know that they're dead? Or is that just what you were told? And so, for example, my grandfather, uh, he was Jim Reeves. He played that role in the country music industry. And then when they were done with that character, for whatever reason, I'm not entirely sure, he was killed. That character was killed off. And my grandfather lived another life as, as the individual that he was. I suppose he was a multiple and he had lots of his own, own problems. Um, and we'll go through some of that. But and so it comes through my family and then my uncle and CIA handler, uh, he was a close uncle, Gail Pooley, and he he was my handler and very close member of our family. And he brought it to the family as well. I'm not entirely sure about the, how that relationship all came together. But so I was selected uh, because of my ability to dissociate. Um, we were tested as children, um, tested by a man named Alex Houston to um, test us for our ability to disassociate. And that took place at my grandfather and grandmother's house outside of Nampa, Idaho at Lake Lowell. And, and that was, that was a pretty, a pretty traumatic little ordeal there. Uh, we were each taken Alex Houston came out to the house. See, my grandparents had gone to Disneyland, and for the for the week, uh, as a as a vacation, a romantic vacation for them to Southern California and Disneyland. And what they were really there for was they were getting um, they were getting told and taught how. And so while they were away to Disneyland getting their, their training on how to raise children in the project, we were uh, at my grandparents' home staying there for the week. And um, they had a guy coming out to entertain us kids. And so we were all waiting. And, you know, as little kids, we were excited. This guy had a dummy doll thing that he was going to show us, you know, and, and do a little show for us. And, and so he came up the drive finally, it was evening, and he, he did a little show for us, Alex and um, what Elmer, I want to say, his dummy. Yeah, and they did this show for us. And then after the show, they said that they wanted to do a test. They wanted to do something with us kids. And so each one of us was taken back into a room there with Alex, uh, and we were tested for our ability to dissociate. And so what that entailed is um, we were taken back there one by one, first of all, and my sister was first, and they had in the room a box that had a hand in it. It was a severed human hand, and they just opened it. So my sister went back there, and she, what, what the thing was, was would you dissociate? And so my sister screamed when she went back there, and they showed it to her. And then my older brother, he was taken back, and he screamed when he saw the human hand. He didn't dissociate. And then when I was taken back, I didn't scream. I saw the hand and I just dissociated from the situation. I was there with my grandfather and his friend. I just dissociated. And so I was taken back. And so I was selected for trauma-based mind control programming sponsored by the Central Intelligence Agency because there's a lot of people doing it, not just the CIA. The satanic, what I call the satanic leader also do 
really rich people, what we consider to be the elite, a lot of them, now I'm not saying all, I don't know that for sure, but what I witnessed was a lot of them are involved with Satanism and trauma-based mind control. They put their own kids through it. And so that was the test that we were put through uh, there at my grandparents' house. And so I was selected at the age of five. And then the next year uh, we began our trauma-based mind control programming at uh, the Disneyland facility in Anaheim, California. There's a lot of human, human bio programming, trauma-based mind control programming going on at Disneyland in Anaheim, California. I realize how crazy that sounds, but that's what's going on. It, the best place to hide something is in plain sight. And so in Disneyland, underneath that park, there are various tunnels and rooms and areas set up specifically for monarch programming, uh, for doing things like filming kitty porn, um, killing people, human trafficking, holding people there uh, for use by the agency or other individuals. I'm not entirely sure who else on that, but there's a lot going on there. And so, we, every year we'd go there. Well, not every year. I take that back. There were a couple years we didn't go, I believe. And so I don't, I don't know, Emma, how many times I've been to Disneyland. So many times that it, it just every year that's where we went on family vacation. Um, but there was a lot of programming that took place there. I've been able to work through uh, my year there in '84, and my year there in 93 or 95 i forget which and so it's been a lot of work though working through those those events and those years and so i'll keep working on them and try to get through them all but there's a lot there to work through and so i started to remember all these awful things taking place in 2017 um which set me on this journey to understand what had happened to me and how I had gotten to where I was. And Disneyland was part of it because my wife would ask me, you know, why can't you remember things about this or that? And I couldn't tell her a whole lot about our trips to Disneyland. Um, and so she noticed that I had memory issues as far as my past goes. And so, um, things like that really started to push me into exploring what was going on. Um, I feel like I should talk about that a little bit, how I came to the point where I was, where I'm at now. Does that make sense, Emma? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. And then we can, you know, kind yeah, of- Is your connection going okay? Yeah, it's good. Okay, my connection's acting up pretty bad and so I'm trying to make sure <laughs> that you can still hear me yep I can hear yeah. you okay very cool yeah so you know Disneyland was a huge part of our lives growing up and I didn't understand the context of that until around 2017 when I started to work through these things and so one of the things that pushed me through even wanting to know what had happened to me in my past um, was the fact that I felt like something was wrong in my life because life was really, Emma, pretty good. Like I had have a beautiful, wonderful wife. We have beautiful children. We had land in Idaho. It was a beautiful place and a beautiful place to be in life. But I felt like something was wrong all the time. In my mind, I felt like there was, uh, it's difficult to explain. And my wife noticed this as well. And one of the things that really was a catalyst though, and so I started to feel like something was just a little bit wrong, but I also began to understand I couldn't remember things. And so, one of the catalysts of that was uh, that Charlie Pride, you maybe have heard me talk about it before, or seen it in my website, Charlie Pride. I went to that Charlie Pride show with my grandparents when I was a teenager. And for the life of me, 
the way that I remembered it initially up until 2017, when I started to work through it, I did not meet Charlie Pride. I did not meet that man. He was backstage and I never talked to him. And when my wife and I were talking about the picture that he signed, it blew me away that he had actually signed it. Because in my mind, he hadn't signed it. We got an autographed picture there at the show. And in my mind, only, oh, two, maybe three individuals had signed it from the band, but not Charlie. And so when my wife said, no, Johnny, Charlie signed that picture. And I went and I found it. And it was signed. It was up in our attic. It blew me away. I was like, oh, my goodness. I just could not believe it. How could it be that I couldn't remember meeting this man? He was a famous country musicianist. Why wouldn't I remember that? And so when I understood that that I couldn't remember things, I thought, well, it was a hard thing to do, Emma, but I thought to myself, I need to see a therapist. That's a hard thing to accept uh, as an individual, that you need to see a therapist because something's wrong. Uh, but I made that choice. I said, something is wrong. And so I started seeing a therapist and I started working through it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see her for very long, because uh, the things that would happen when I'd come to see her, uh, it just started to, to scare her. And the things that I was talking about, she didn't, it was just way over her head. She was this sweet, sweet older lady, this older Christian lady. And, and it just, it was too much for her, really, all of it. And so I was only able to see her for a short time, you know, which was unfortunate. But she helped me a lot. She helped me to work through that first barrier because in, in Monarch programming, you hit walls. You hit walls and they're difficult to go through. And it takes something to push you sometimes through that wall. And so that's really, that leads right into the premise of Monarch programming, which is dissociation and the creation of multiple personalities within an individual. And so that's the whole point of all of that. I don't know if we've said that. Another thing I'd like to say, just so folks are aware, as we're talking about these things, we may cover some things that are triggers. Um, I don't know if you warned anyone of that yet or not, but that might be something people need to pay attention to. So that there will be triggers in our conversation. So I started seeing a therapist and and um, started to work through all my memories and tried to understand clearly what I had, uh, what had happened to me when I was a child. And what I started to find was just mind blowing, Emma. It just blew me away. And one day I came home and my wife, she was, she was down taking a walk and I ran down to her on her walk there on our property. And I said, babe, Babe, this is really weird, but you're married to a CIA sleeper agent, a CIA sleeper assassin. I said, this is really, it really freaked me out because of the things that I was remembering. And one of the ways that I was able to start working through these things, really, the therapist helped a lot, Emma, but what really helped was journaling it out. I read some of Kathy O'Brien's work. I haven't read it all. Um, seems to me like she's a wonderful individual and I think very highly of her, but her work is really interesting and really well done. And so I read her first book and some of, so when I thought, saw a therapist and started to understand that something was wrong and we started to work through it, um, after that period of time started, I started looking into Kathy's work. And one of the things that really blew me away in Kathy's work uh, were the correlations. And so, for example, there's a part in Kathy's book where she talks about being programmed to be a message courier by someone sticking a knife in her chest. And the first night I read this, I didn't, it didn't hit me. And I put the book away and I went to bed. And then the next night I sat down with the book and I 
was reading it and I didn't know where I had left off the night before. And so I just started at the top of the page and said, I'll just read the whole thing. And so I started reading the whole page again. And when I came through the, the section where she talks about the individual sticking a knife in her, it hit me like a ton of bricks. My uncle doing the same programming to myself. And my uncle was the first person that I remember doing it to me. I was had that happen to me by several individuals and was also tortured in that way by my grandfather uh, at another experience in McCall. And that was actually on the 4th of July. That's something I haven't written about, but that was a horrific experience. They're just cruel people. They're disassociative multiples. And so, but back to this, back to where I was at. And so I, I remembered this event uh, occurring and it just blew me away because I have a scar on my chest in the exact location that Kathy described. I just took my shirt off and I was like, holy shit, look. And I could remember my uncle with the switchblade sticking it in me, making me memorize some things. That's what I first remembered. And so that was really shocking. The scars that I found on my body have really been been difficult to to just disregard because I have scars that I, I'm I've been like, well, how did I even get that for years? I wonder how did I get this scar? Where did it come from? And to remember where I got them is is interesting. It, it really you just remember how you got a scar that's that's all there is to it you just remember um so do you have any questions emma i'm sorry i'm talking an awful lot no you're doing awesome thank you so much for everything that you're sharing i know that this stuff you know it's like you said it, it sounds crazy because it is you know these are literal psychopaths that are you know collaborating together to exploit the gifts that we're born with in children you know and it's it's just horrific you know and then seeing all the different elements that go into these stories you know people get little snippets here and there about you know human trafficking for example you know that word yeah. kind of buzzword now but like the misunderstanding of what that entails to the depths of it and even as you were talking about with therapy you know it's really sad even that in therapeutic settings you know did um trauma actually storing in the body manifesting as disease you know and the different symptoms that sra and mk ultra survivors go through it's so discredited and you know conspiratorial in a sense and it's really sad you know because it's like gosh how amazing how much more amazing would your healing journey maybe have been in the beginning if you would have had a therapist that like was on the same page with you and was like oh i know exactly like you have did you know let's, let's work through it yeah of like getting scared you know so i really appreciate you bringing light to all of this because it it doesn't sound crazy when you actually hear all the pieces and how they fit together in a story like yours you know it makes sense and so you talking about this is so important to validate so many other experiences of people who maybe can't get up here and talk or will never have a voice for whatever reason. You know, it's so validating for people listening and for other survivors. So you're doing awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Right on. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you can hear me on that side. My internet is working a little better now. So oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to ask though, if I can, um, you mentioned... The 4th of July, is there anything in particular about that day um, of why they would choose the 4th of July for an event? I don't sell, I don't hear that event talked about as much as say Christmas or some of the other holidays that they choose to do really horrible things on. And since it's July, I thought maybe I'd ask you about the significance. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question, Emma. Um, they They use holidays a lot and so there they use they use and they used on me holidays a lot and so i have to pay particular attention to those like you say christmas thanksgiving big family get togethers when people would get together my family we lived really close with the my my abuse base was close and so it get togethers even included birthdays I got to watch those because a lot of things on your birthday, 
Um, but the 4th of July, I, I don't know quite how to answer that because it is um, an important day in the country and for uh, various patriots. And so, yeah, I, I don't quite know how to answer that. Yeah, I don't know of the randonimity of that date compared to any other. So as far as a holiday goes anyway. Yeah, that's totally fine. I appreciate you, you know, even just explaining the holiday concept because it is, you know, they they take everything that's good and they twist it. So it's not. They do. What they do uh, is they turn it upside down. Um, they, yeah, to use a, a trigger is up is down. And so in Satanism and in the project, um, up is down. You take good, turn it bad. You take bad, you make it good. Dark becomes light. They're, they're really into opposites. And so it's important to pay attention to opposites. Uh, for example, uh, one opposite to pay attention to is uh, in numbers. The number 666 is always considered to be the devil's number. But in Satanism, everything's inverted. And so an even more important number is 999 because 999 has been inverted. And so it has hidden meaning. And so that's something I pay close attention to when I'm out and about. And maybe there's a car that is making me uncomfortable. What does this license plate say? So yeah, just as a side note there. Um, but Maybe what I wouldn't mind doing really quick, Emma, is uh, explaining to folks what trauma-based mind control is, because yeah. there might be some folks who don't understand that. And this helps to explain why I'm trying to blow the whistle on this, because I've tried very hard to blow the whistle on this. I've contacted the FBI. I've contacted the Attorney General of the United States. I've contacted Trump when he was in office. I don't trust Biden. I'm not going to contact Biden. I don't want to get into politics, but um, I've contacted a lot of people and I've tried to blow the whistle on this, even down to talking to local sheriffs. And everyone is just afraid of it. They, they don't even know how to, even as law enforcement, to process it. Or, or they've been told to shut up and they're not going to talk to me about it. Right. One or the other. One or the other, yeah. And so what it is, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency's trauma-based mind control program, it, it is essentially taking children um, and bringing them up through trauma. Uh, the most important children are children who were generationally abused. So children who abuse is, runs in their family. One of the most horrific forms of abuse for a child uh, to push you to a point of dissociation is child abuse and child abuse by your own family. It's, it's awful and it's so awful that it pushes your mind out of your body, you disassociate. Sometimes you leave entirely. And I can remember, uh, I have several flashes of, I should say on that, of being out of my body. I can remember being out of my body when I was in the, uh, depth tanks and they had run me through suicide programming but that was a different experience but they will push you out of your body and the point of the whole project is just that to find children that disassociate who are strong in disassociation and the strongest ones come from generationally abusive families and a lot of those generationally abusive families uh, come from elite bloodlines and so the rich are into this, like I was saying, the very wealthy, they live a completely different lifestyle, one might say, than the general population. And the strongest that disassociate are those that come from generationally abusive families. And then you include in that satanic generationally abusive families. And that's what I come from is from a generational, a satanic, generationally abusive family. My family are Satanists, and they are hiding in the Mormon church. Religious institutions are free of this, and it's not only the government. Um, religious institutions are aware of this. I was raised in the Mormon church, and so that's where my background comes from. And I was connected to Gordon B. Hinckley and uh, Thomas Monson and Aaron. 
And those are the individuals that were in my life. I was going to be placed under uh, Hinckley in an internship in Salt Lake. But back to what I was talking about with the purpose of it, the purpose of it and how they do it is they do it through trauma. And um, so they abuse you from the time that you're born. I can remember being abused as far back as I can remember. And and then they make you witness awful things. And so my grandfather, for example, he was a psychopath and he killed people for the CIA. And so I would have to witness uh, this uh, firsthand as well as the disposal of individuals, which was very bad to go through. And so I don't eat pork. Uh, a lot of people that were, were killed by the agency and the satanic network were fed to hogs they're fed to pigs pigs will eat anything and so i've heard people talk about well where's the evidence where are the bodies for these things well they were fed to hogs it's they control hog farms and so there's also other means such as there's a beetle that'll eat the human body as well and so i've witnessed those being used as well and those are not a very cheap option they're very expensive um so you witness all these horrible things. The first time I can remember people being killed was in Disneyland. Um, this little girl that was held under the park there and we were taken off of a ride um, and taken down under the park and then made to witness a, what I would call a blood sacrifice ceremony of sorts. And um, that's a long story. Do you want me to tell that story? It's kind of gruesome. I can tell it if you want. It's up to you if you're comfortable telling it. I know it always gives listeners context, but there's absolutely no pressure if it's not something that you want to get into right now. Okay. I don't mind talking about it. These things are all pretty awful and they're, you know, I lived through it. So. And on this but, show too, like you're, you're the audience listening to you. They've listened to, you know, they kind of expect a level of discomfort. You know, they're, they're listening to horrible things every episode, you know, so you're in front of the right people who are going to be receptive to, you know, holding and holding space for what you're saying. Okay. Okay. So at Disneyland, uh, one of the ways that they do programming, and this isn't the only way, but one of the ways is uh, they will act like a ride broke down. And so you'll be loaded on the ride and then the ride will start up. And usually you're put in between various cars so my family my older brother and sister oftentimes would be loaded in front of us me and my younger brother because my younger brother was also selected uh during the test for alex houston and so he also went through a lot of a lot of trauma-based mind control programming and we went through it together and so we would be loaded on the ride but they'd put a car between us or two and then put us on and then send us in and then the ride would break down and it would stop and it wouldn't be going and a, a moment or two would go by we would be unloaded from that ride it would be in the it would stop at the right spot and we would be unloaded from the ride and we would be taken under the park and in one particular instance uh, on my first trip there i can remember being taken under the park, taken off the ride, and being made to witness my grandfather, um, yeah, committing murder under the park. So what happened is uh, it was the wild toad ride, and it stopped uh, out in the ride. I was with my little brother and my dad, and someone came out through a door out of the, the ride setting, and they got us. Um, but my, we were scared, me and my little brother. And so we didn't want to go without our dad. And he came with us that time. This was right at the beginning of it all in my life, as far as programming at Disneyland. And so he came with us and we went under the park and, <clears throat> and when we got down into the tunnels, we were taken into a room by this uh, young man and my grandfather was in this room. It was very dark. My grandfather was in there. He had the robe on, a black robe. 
And he was very angry at this individual for bringing my dad. He told him not to bring my dad with him. And so he, he had to take my dad back up. My grandpa, he took me and my little brother back into this other room. And in that room, Emma, were cages set up in that room. And they were set up around what I would consider to be an altar. And that altar was there for, for killing people, for killing the children that were held under the park in these cages. And so this might be really hard for people to hear, but these people are inhuman. And the trauma that they're trying to initiate is so bad, it's unimaginable. There are children that were held under the park at that time in cages. And my grandfather, he, he killed in front of me and my little brother, uh, one of the girls um, that was held there. She was just this sweet little girl. And he just took her out. Yeah. And he he put her on the on the altar and he he killed that little girl. And the altar was designed so that um, the blood of the people that they would kill would be caught and they would catch it in a in a bowl. It was usually white because of the contrast of the blood. And see, blood, Emma, that's drawn through trauma, it has certain chemicals in it. And Satanists believe that that blood is powerful and it gives them longevity in life. And so a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, too, when we're talking about trauma-based mind control, is um, it's very satanic and it's involved with dark magic. When I first remembered or, or I shouldn't say first remember, when I first started to remember, and it, when I realized what I had lived through, it hit me so hard when I broke through the wall when I was with my therapist. And now we're going back to 2017 when I was seeing my therapist. It, it felt as though I had broken a, a very powerful spell. That is the only way I could describe it to my wife, was that a very powerful spell had been broken. And so there's a lot of Satanism involved with it, in particular in what I was, what I experienced and what I lived through, unfortunately, and what a lot of other people live through, which is terrible. But back to Disneyland. That little girl was uh, murdered and we were made to drink and consume her blood. My grandfather made my little brother and I both also drink it. They started that from a very young age and that followed through my life uh, up until oh, I was a young adult. The last time I can remember being made to do that was uh, on an operation in Haley, Idaho, there in outside of Ketchum. And so then you'd be put back on the ride. So at Disneyland, we were made to be involved with these things. And then we'd be put back on the ride. And then the ride would start up again. All these things, uh, we were also made to make porn under there. That was a common theme. And, um, and be involved with things of that nature. There were also people, Emma, that were there uh, being programmed for acting, which is interesting to me. And so the, in the project, in the program, there are your program, a lot of people are programmed for different life paths, I would call them. And so for me, I was being raised uh, in a family where we got rid of people for the federal government. That's what we did as a family. And we also got rid of people uh, with the satanic network. And the satanic network that I was involved with is uh, directly connected to the Mormon church, uh, which is, it's just too bad that the religious institutions are involved with these things. But that's somewhere that Satan is high. And so the Mormon church is well aware of trauma-based mind control programming and, and they're directly involved with it. They provide generationally abused children to the church. One of the big things in the church, for example, is genealogy. That genealogy that they're working on is also used to find elite family bloodlines, satanic family bloodlines, and they're able to follow that, and they're able to work with those children. This helps them in the project. And so these various institutions, such as religion, government, 
those are able to be used uh, by the satanic elite and by the government intelligence community for various things. And that's one of the things that they use it for. And so I've jumped around an awful lot. I want to finish up on, on the premise of trauma-based mind control programming um, because it is important. And so the premise of it is to cause you to disassociate through trauma. We talked about that. And then once you are in that state of disassociation and trauma, they program you, we could call it, with a new personality for whatever it is they want you doing in that personality. And so there are lots of different personalities that they will create. I don't know how many I have, uh, but I've learned to work through them. That's something that I still work with and still have to work through. And they will create them for uh, doing things like, um, well, we've talked about assassinations. They will program you to do such things as that or murder for the network. They will also program you to make pornography. I was made to make an extensive amount of child pornography. I was used as a child um, to make I, I can't even tell you how much. And my family was heavily involved with that. They had a video store there in Nampa. And, and so out the front door, they'd be renting videos about Disneyland and the recent blockbusters. And then out the back door would go kitty porn. It was very messed up. And I can remember being made to be involved with that, uh, clear up into being a young adult. And that's something that the satanic leader into too. What we're talking about are moral boundaries. And if you're a Satanist, you are not concerned about moral boundaries. Those are something for common people. And so it, yeah, it's difficult to get into the minds of those folks. They're, yeah, they're not very healthy. But the premise of it is to create those personalities so that they can use you for various tasks. And one of the benefits of, of a mind slave, because that's what it is, you're a slave, you're a trauma-based mind slave, you're, you're living in a state of mind slavery, which to me is one of the worst things you can do to an individual. And that's one of the reasons that I'm so outspoken on this is because you steal someone's free will to, to live their life and do what they will with their own body and their own mind. They steal your mind through this process of disassociation and the creation of another personality or multiples of them. And so it's a terrible thing to do. You're stealing someone's free will, which is just wrong. You're, you're living in an upside down um, world. And what they're able to do, Emma, is make it so that you can't remember being in that personality or going through the trauma that you endured. And so, yes, you are caused to dissociate, you're put through trauma, which in and of itself is difficult on the human mind and difficult to recall, pure trauma. And then you add into it creating a multiple personality well, the CIA in particular has gotten very good at the scientific aspect of it, we're going to call it. And one of those scientific aspects is hypnosis. This is an old practice that is very effective on disassociated people, and they will use uh, hypnosis. Uh, every time I was put through trauma, I was put through hypnosis afterward to remember to forget those events. And they will put various things in that hypnosis, like uh, suicide programming and things like that, if, if that's what they're working with. And so they will use hypnosis. And then another thing that they will use is electrocution. And so my father, he was given when I was six years old and I was in Disneyland there in 84, we were at the hotel. And... Um, this is where a nefarious individual named Mr. Byrd comes in because um, I knew Senator Robert Byrd. He was a scumbag. He was in charge of, of uh, funding the Central Intelligence Agency's mind control program. Not a good person. And he was friends with my grandfather. My grandfather and him worked together. I'm not quite 
positive about the extent of that, but it seemed to be pretty extensive from what I can remember. And so when I was in Disneyland, we were, me and my little brother, we were sent out and we were in a hotel to backtrack just a little bit, just to digress. We were in the hotel. We'd been at Disneyland all day. This was after we'd witnessed that, that little girl um, having, you know, being murdered. And we were taken back to the hotel after that day at the hottest part of the day. And we went swimming. And so when we were swimming, my mother, she stayed in the hotel and she came and got us after a short time. My dad, he was out swimming with us, but my mom came out and she got uh, my little brother and I and my dad and brought us back inside. And um, there was someone there to see us. And so we went out front and it was my grandfather and Senator Bird. And they were there. Uh, they had a black Cadillac that they had driven there. They liked fancy, nice cars. And they were both in suits. And as a kid, I was like, my God, it's so hot. How can you even be in that thing? And that was um, that was the first year as a Disneyland. And Bird gave my father a taser uh, at that time out there in the parking lot. He said, here, this is for uh, working with the kids. You have to use this on them. And he explained that we had to pick a spot on our bodies where we were going to get hit with this thing for the rest of our lives because it leaves a scar. And I have that scar right here on my leg. And I was always told it was a birthmark as far back as I can remember. But I'm like, no, 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 dude, I remember. That's not that's not a birthmark. And so. um we were hit with a taser after we talked to them. So Mr. Bird and my grandfather, they left. They talked to us for a little while, you know, asked us how Disneyland was and all that and asked how we were doing because we were pretty shook up from it as little kids, really, you know. And then we were taken back into the hotel and my father hit us with those things. And you want to talk about betrayal, Emma, the feeling of just pure betrayal because I had no idea what was coming. I was six years old. And to be taken back into the bathroom and, you know, my dad's like, so where are we going to do this thing at? And I had to choose, you know, on my leg and, and then wham, and I just went down and the pain is just indescribable of what that thing does. But it, 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 it erases your, it doesn't erase your memory. It compartmentalizes it. It pushes it away. It pushes it back. And with the hypnotism, you give it a conduit to go away as well. That's something else that's important because these things are all used in conjunction with each other. It's not just you can do one thing and expect an outcome. And so they're all used in conjunction. They have it down to a science. And so people like me, because we disassociate and we have multiple personalities for multiple purposes, we're used for a lot of nefarious and illegal activities by the federal government. And so you'd be brought in for, for basically the dirty deeds of the federal government, what they needed to do that, that could not be out in the open, and they needed to have full deniability of it. And so I was involved with things like assassinations, for example, where we would be sent in and we would get rid of people. Uh, I was used in, um, in Japan, for example, over in Kobe, Japan. That was in 1997, I want to say. And I was taken over there and we got rid of a man named Masaru Takumi. And I was a sniper that was positioned up on a roof because the gang that was going in see the Masaru Takumi story is very long because Masaru was uh, connected to the cult the Aum Shinrikyo cult and the gassing of the Tokyo subway system he he provided funds he didn't know it he didn't know he was providing funds to the Aum Shinrikyo and that they were gonna use it to gas the Tokyo subway system. He didn't know, but his mistress was the brother of Haideki Seijo, who it was a famous musicianist in Japan. He died back in 2018 when I started to remember all these things. All of a sudden Haideki dies of a heart attack within 
oh, I forget how long when I started to remember. It was terrible. But he was involved because he supported the Aum Shinrikyo cult and he would provide them with funds. I don't know that he knew what they were gonna do with them either, but his sister who was Masaru's mistress would ask Masaru for money. She'd give it to her brother, he'd give it to the cult. And that cult uh, ended up gassing the Tokyo subway system. But the cult itself was an MK Ultra product. It's, it's such, a, such a twisted deep network that they have created. And so those people in that cult that were at the top were mind slaves. And they were created uh, through monarch programming and they were a CIA asset. And the CIA was well aware that they were gonna gas the Tokyo subway system and the Pentagon even provided the gas. They are the ones who sold the cult the gas to do it, which is, it's incredible the way the network goes. But People aren't all good and they don't all see the world through the same eyes that that people who are good see the world through. And that is a problem, but we can learn to work through it. Part of the problem is the National Security Act. A lot of these things are hidden behind the 1947 National Security Act. And people have no idea what's going on. They don't know. And it's all under lock and key labeled as top secret and classified. And people aren't allowed to see it. And so it's a terrible thing. Do right. yeah. you have any questions, Emma? I've been talking an awful lot. No, you're doing great. This is a lot of information. I appreciate you giving some background on that. Um, again, it makes it validating to understand the logistics and the intent behind creating something like this, because without the context, again, yeah. all this stuff, the way that it has been leaked into society, the little bits and pieces that people get, again, it, it becomes conspiratorial. So really understanding the history and the purpose and realizing we're not taught about how powerful our bodies are and our brains are in school, that, that information that the divinity within us is left out of any education like people feel like crap we have depression everywhere and if people understood how how they could use something that you understand that was exploited in you for something good yeah we could be able to in an instant turn all this around you know but they hide that divinity from us and instead they know it exists and they exploit it on the back end and profit from it and it is so sick and sad you know and Again, like you being able to to break that down so eloquently and to articulate the purposes, why somebody would want a mind slave, right? Why wouldn't the government want just kind of not expendable people, but people that aren't them to do their dirty deeds so they can continue to be in the spotlight and look good and have other people go and do the stuff that they, you know, are, are too you know, cowardly to do themselves in a sense and, and, and so evil to even want to do to begin with, you know? So I just want to thank you for giving some of that history because it really does help people connect dots in their head and say, that makes sense. Like I could see our government wanting to do that. I could see how and why somebody would choose a church to hide this in, you know, it, it's the perfect disguise exactly how you know freemasons hide in plain view and through charity and they're so evil you know and you even mentioned disney you know he was a walt disney was a freemason i've heard higher than the 33rd degree but i mean these people hide in these very you know charismatic and exciting archetypes you know and even talking about your grandpa like wearing the identity of a a singer that's just literally a, a an alias. It wasn't even his true identity. You know, these things yeah. are so left out of society. So I really appreciate what you're bringing to the table because it does validate these stories on such a deep level. And I know it's going to be, it's going to be very helpful in connecting dots with people. Yeah. Yeah. All the stories coming together do help connect the dots, but something I'd like to add when I first started to remember these things, I had a friend of mine ask me, he said, why would they do this? Why would they, why would they want someone like that? Why wouldn't they just have, have an agent or a soldier do that? And 
the reason, Emma, is because it's not all black and white. And if you have a healthy minded individual who is your agent or soldier and you tell them, I want you to kill this man who is an enemy of the state and I want you to kill his wife and his children as well, that individual is going to say he's going to question that or she. That individual, if they're a healthy-minded individual, is going to question that. That's immoral. And that's one of the reasons that they want mind slaves. It, it is because they don't remember, because they will do things such as smuggle drugs or be used in porn or be used for blackmail or be used for assassination, and they won't remember. But it's also because they will do what you tell them to do without question. That's a big key to it as well. And so I had to explain that to my friend. And when you bring that into context, it also helps with an understanding of it because it is dark and it is evil. I was used, um, so I was raised in, in this program with, through the Central Intelligence Agency and I was used for all kinds of nefarious things, including child porn and assassinations, which is too bad. It's a terrible thing and a terrible thing to live with. But And I do, if I could ask you one question, actually. Yeah, can you, you can. Explain the role that your parents played in this or how, like, kind of their history and their role, um, whether they were mind control slaves to you or sort of how they fit into the picture. Well, that's a good question, Emma. Yeah, so my father, he was very, he was abusive, but he seems as though he was a disassociative multiple in some way as well. And he was involved with the project um, because my grandfather it involved all of us in the project that he was able to. And so my father, he was involved with the project, but he didn't, we all have strength, strengths and weaknesses. And my father, um, he made it uh, so far, I guess you would say, in the project. And his role um, when he had us was to raise us, um, to raise us in the program and in the project. And so he was one of our key abusers. And so it seems to me that he was a dissociative multiple because of the horrendous abuse that he was capable of. My mother, she also seems to be a dissociative multiple, but I don't, yeah, I, I pray for my mother. I hope that she's okay, but yeah, but I, it, that's a difficult one because she seems to me more like a tool than anything who is disassociative and they're able to work with and keep her under control, I would say. And so my parents, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Because I know yeah. it does it does have a generational effect, you know, and a lot of times, unfortunately, there does seem to be more of a, I know they're all unconscious to a degree, but there, do, there does seem to be kind of a leader in the family that originally takes on the role. And then it's very dissociative on the way down, you know, to where it's just an autopilot, you know, multi-generational. It's how the trauma stores in the DNA, you know, it just becomes like a normal pattern in the family. So it's really yeah. sad to hear about that, you know, that your father also didn't, you know, have his free will and, you know, was forced to do these horrific things. It's just, it's disgusting and it's sad, you know, it's. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But. That is what they do, though. They use families because families have a huge bind of trust within them. You know, your your family, that's someone that you should be able to trust. Right. Completely. Yes. Yeah. Not in the project. No. Yeah. So so I was raised in this in the CIA's mind control program, but we were protected through the Mormon church, I would say. Uh, a message that I would like to communicate is that the Mormon church is being controlled by a satanic cobble. Those men who are up there at the top, those men are not good people. They're very bad people. 
I personally knew Hinckley. I met him back in 95 after he became the prophet. And I met Thomas Monson. Um, and they were both bad people, not good. And Hinckley I met because my, my uncle and CIA handler, he did the presentation for Hinckley. I, I don't know if you're LDS at all or if you were raised in the church, Emma, but that in the church, the prophet, he's like the head guy. He's the pope, you would say, of, of the LDS church. And he was invited to, to, uh, to my uncle's ward. I suppose he was invited. He came to my uncle's ward to speak in Haley, Idaho. And that's where I met him because I was told that I had to come and, and meet the prophet and see him speak. And so we went and my uncle, he housed us, me and a friend of mine who was also a mind slave as well. Uh, I was, I was uh, raised around other kids that were also mind slaves and that were in the project and in the program. And we'd be used to handle each other and keep each other in line uh, or be used for um, aliases for various things. You know, where was so-and-so? Oh, well, this person can vouch that they were over here. But we met, uh, we met Hinckley there in Haley uh, they we did a presentation for him because my uncle arranged it because Hinckley had just become the prophet of the Mormon church, the president, and he wanted to know what was going on with the Mormon kids from abusive families and satanic families. He wanted to know what the government was doing with us. And so me and this other kid, Chris, we were used in a presentation and it was done in my uncle's basement in his office there. And um, we were used uh, to show what it was that they were doing with us. And so I thought as a kid, you know, that I was going to hear the prophet speak and I was just going to go to church and that was that. But we went to church and we heard Hinckley talk and it was really weird when he even arrived at all because he came in through the side door after church had already started and then he was seated up in the front and he sat next to my uncle and they talked for quite a while. And it looked like they were having quite the conversation. I can remember watching them and I was like, my goodness, what is what is Gail doing talking with Hinckley? What are they talking about? Because you got to keep in mind, we're in the middle of the service. Someone's giving a talk, you know, and so they're up there talking. And then Hinckley was finally got up. He gave his talk. It was short and and just just pretty mundane. Uh, I was blown away. I was expecting something prophetic, like, wow, this is the prophet. This is going to be incredible. I'm going to be moved, Emma, beyond imagination. No, I, it was like, wow, okay. I've heard that talk like 10,000 times in my Mormon <laughs> past, you know. And so that was a little disappointing. And then they they, he sat down after giving his talk and he talked to my uncle for a little while more. And then they left. Uh, the prophet left uh, in the middle of the meeting. They said, OK, everyone, we're stopping for a minute and the prophet's leaving. And so they all left through the same side door they come in. But when he'd come in, Emma, he was surrounded by bodyguards, uh, the prophet, which blew me away. I was I, I was a young man and I'm sitting there and I'm like, why? why would the Mormon prophet need to be surrounded by bodyguards? It didn't make much sense to me in my mind, because I figured if you were a man of God, God's going to take care of you until it's time to go. And then it's time to go. And so what's the problem? Why would you worry about it if you were the prophet? Well, he was surrounded by bodyguards. And so then they all left and then sacrament meeting ended and, uh, Chris and I, we had been told that we're supposed to go back over to my uncle's house after church, and we're supposed to um, come back over there because there was something going on. And so we were told to head over there, and we got in our car, we drove over there. First, I talked to my cousin because I was a little nervous about it. I was, I was like, why are we going over there? What's going on? And so I went and found my cousin, and she told me, no, we're not going back over to the house well, what are you talking about? And her and her friends went back in the building. Well, Chris and I were like, well, we better get over there. You know, my, I knew my uncle didn't like to be made to wait. And so we headed up there, drove up to the house. We went inside. It seemed like no one was there. We went down in the basement 
and uh, knocked on the door. Well, we were supposed to do a secret handshake. Uh, my uncle had shown me this handshake. You, you see, Emma, before this, the night before the, uh, all this happened, before the prophet spoke, we stayed at my uncle's house and we stayed in the basement next to my uncle's office. And uh, we were very heavily abused that night because they were getting us ready to meet the Mormon prophet. My grandfather came up from the Boise Valley. It was about a two and a half, three hour drive from Boise to Haley. My grandfather drove up and another individual that I know as Kyle, he was there. And if Kyle wouldn't have been there, it would have been really bad. My grandfather might have killed us. It was such a horrible experience. And my grandfather was out of his mind. And so they tortured us through the night. I don't, I'm not sure how long they tortured us for and, and worked on us uh, to get us ready for in the morning. And in the morning, when I woke up, I felt terrible, Emma. I just felt horrible. And my body would just felt awful. And I, I couldn't understand why. I, I was like, is the room stuffy? What is wrong with me? And got out of bed, got moving. And my uncle, he met me in the hall. And he told me that he needed to show me a handshake. And this is where he told me I needed to come back to the house after church. And he showed me this handshake. And he said, you need to remember this because when you come back after church, you need to come down to the office and you, you need to know this handshake to get in the door when you get here. And I was just kind of like, okay, like I was half awake. I'd been up all night being tortured and he showed it to me and I could not remember it. And he says, do you got it? And I tried it again and I, I couldn't hardly remember this handshake. And he, he was like, okay, you got it. You're good. And then he left. And, and in my mind, I was like, oh, no, I, I don't got it. I sure hope I got it because I don't feel like I do. And then, <laughs> and so we went to church and we listened to the prophet and all that. And then we came back to the house. Well, now we're standing at the door to get into his office. And I knock on the door and Chris, he's behind me. And Chris, he was a young man. He was a funny kid. He had a loaf of bread. We'd been fasting all morning because we were supposed to fast. We were often told we couldn't eat when we were going through programming sessions because it affects the human mind. It puts you into more of a survival state. And so we were fasting, quote, that morning. And so Chris, he grabbed a loaf of bread on the way in and he's standing there eating a loaf of bread. And I knock on the door and the door i hear some noise inside and i was like oh man what what is going on in here and the, the door opens and a hand sticks out and i see the hand and i realize okay i have to know the handshake now and so i tried to shake his hand and remember but emma i couldn't remember what the handshake was my uncle had not programmed me well enough to remember it these people are not perfect and they don't get everything right and in my mind, you know, they have a process, but they're really not that great at it. There's a lot of flaws to it. And yeah, part of it is just because they're scum. But I couldn't remember the handshake. And so, <clears throat> so the hand goes back in and the door closes. And I hear some, some murmuring behind the door. And I was like, oh no, I did not remember it. Now in the project, Emma, if you screwed up, you <clears throat> just period you didn't know how long you were going to be alive you witnessed so many people die in front of you and part of that was to keep you on a on a constant state of alertness that you better keep your shit together and you better do your job right or you might be the one who's next and so i was a little afraid about the fact that i couldn't remember well chris just pushed me out of the way luckily chris could remember well i guess luckily we should have ran the hell out of there at that moment but chris could remember and he pushed me out of the way he knocked on the door the hand came out and he was able to shake it and we were able to go inside and so he did remember because my uncle showed it to him as well and so we went inside and uh, gordon was in there with his entourage of bodyguards at first i couldn't see gordon i was 
just walking in this room and there's all these dudes in there in suits of various ages. A lot of them were young men. There was an older gentleman there, I remember. And we went in there and Gordon, he was sitting at my uncle's desk and he was turned backward so that we couldn't see him. And my uncle was standing there and he says, come in boys, there's someone I want you to meet. Well, it was Gordon, it was Gordon B. Hinckley. He was there and that was the reason for his trip to Haley. It wasn't to give that mundane speech or talk at church. It was because he was interested in the project and we were there to do a presentation for him. And so that night before we had, um, we had gone, you could say we'd gone through the presentation and all the aspects of everything we were gonna cover uh, in this presentation and so we were made to we were made to strip naked there in front of Gordon we were made to uh, enact homosexual uh, acts have homosexual sex there in front of Hinckley we were um, made to electrocute each other with a cattle prod in various ways uh, yeah my grandfather had brought the cattle prod he was yeah not a very good person and then we were made to um, show him assassinations and not just how did how we do it, but how we would even die ourselves. And so because as a mind slave, you mentioned disposability a little while ago. Well, you just might be disposable. And there are a lot of folks in the project that are disposable, but the what what are called the chosen are not, we're going to say, disposable. You could be used as disposable if it was for some big purpose, like some kind of cultural or social or political event, and you were going to die in it. You could be, uh, you could be killed in that way. But for the general rule, I would say those that weren't of the chosen were the ones selected to be killed most of the time. But in this particular presentation, I was made to get on my knees and I was buck ass naked. We both were. And uh, Chris held a knife to my throat and they explained how, you know, I would die and Chris would kill me. And Chris, uh, he would have killed me, Emma. The, he was starting to push that knife into my throat. I could feel it pierce the skin. I could feel the blood running down my neck. And in my mind, I was like, oh, shit is Gail pissed at me? That's what was going through my head. Are, are they pissed at me? Did I do something? And this is it, like it's over. And so I started to turn my head because my uncle and Hinckley were talking and it was, this was all just normal stuff. Like, like, you know, two, two, three guys all sitting around talking about it, though there were several others in the room, but those guys were there as, as uh, security, but they, you know, they were just talking and about these things as I'm on, there on my knees and I had to turn my head so that my uncle, when he finally looked my way again, could see that I was bleeding and that I was about to, Chris was about to kill me. And my uncle was like, hey, Chris, don't kill Johnny. What are you doing? You know, don't kill him. We're not, we're not going to kill him right now. And so he took the knife away and they didn't kill me, which which is good it you know i'm glad to be alive but we also demonstrated pain uh, as well but right after that we demonstrated what we what they do to not talk to program us to not talk because that was a big question hinkley had how do you keep him from talking so after this presentation see emma i was going to be moved into a position directly under hinkley I was supposed to be in some kind of internship. I don't quite understand it. I was being moved to the Salt Lake area, to Sandy, Utah, and I was going to be um, under Hinckley in some kind of an internship thing. That's the reason that I went and met Thomas Monson and uh, met with Ehring was because I was supposed to be moved up there and they were going to be using me for things. And so this was the first time that I'd met Hinckley was at this presentation that that we're doing it there in Haley. Well, I'd seen him speak, but this is when I really met him. And he had this guy there with him. Um, but back to the not talking thing, okay? He wanted to know how we were kept from talking. And so we were brought up to the desk and we were made to hold knives to our genitalia and, and say that we would remove our own manhood if we were to ever talk. 
And this is the kind of programming that they're putting in these young people's minds. And this is such a horrific thing that, that as a young man, it would just, it's awful. And so even the thought of it is horrible. And so these are the kinds of things that they're programming young people to do in the event that they would ever talk. And so we would, at that time, yeah, I'd never talked at that time. And then the next thing that we did uh, was we were tortured by an individual there in Hinckley's entourage. Because Hinckley, even after all these things, Emma, was still skeptical. How, you know, you have to picture this guy and he's watching all these things. Well, how do you really know that it's all working, that, that this isn't all just a show? And so we were to be tortured. And the rule was that we weren't allowed to be bruised or scarred. And so they couldn't do anything to us that would bruise us or scar us because people would ask questions about that. Scars are a big deal in monarch programming. You're not, a, if someone else scars you, they're in deep shit. You don't want to hurt one of the chosen because there are consequences to that. And I'll get into that. We got rid of people that would, that harm or uh, injure uh, me, for example. But Hinckley, he picked a guy. So one of Hinckley's guys was supposed to do the torturing for him because he wanted to know that it was properly done and that pain was truly administered. If my uncle did it, how was he to know that he was really doing it? And so he picked this guy, he was an older guy. I'm not quite sure how old, it seems like 50s or 60s or something, maybe a little older. And he was ex-military, very short, uh, flat top style haircut. And uh, he tortured us both. And he twisted our arms is what he did. He twisted our arms up behind our backs and just reamed them and twisted them good. Um, this left no scar and it didn't bruise anything. And I can remember being put through that. And it was really painful, uh, but we didn't scream. Uh, that was part of our programming. We would enter what I call my Tin, ma tin Man programming. And so this goes back to the Wizard of Oz programming. Uh, they use various formats, we'll call it, for programming, such as The Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, Batman, etc. And so my Tin Man personality kicked in. And when you're in that state, you work through the pain, um, but you don't, it's difficult to describe. It's there, but you're able to block it out. There are times when I've blocked it out entirely and have not felt anything. And there's times where it is painful, but you are able to work through it. Uh, this time with this guy, it was painful and I was able to work through it. And so he tortured us both. And then we did the presentation uh, and this convinced Hinckley because this, it was his guy doing it, you know, and then, um, and then we did uh, remote viewing for Gordon. Uh, remote viewing, uh, psychic abilities are something that uh, people are prone to who have been abused. And so the young children who've been abused for their whole life are more prone to psychic abilities than are uh, healthy-minded people who have not been put through such things. And Part of the reason I would say, Emma, is that uh, you have a closer relationship to the other side when you are in real need. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like your senses. It's like you have hypersensibility in, in, in a way where everything yep. is constantly like your discernment. You're so much more aware of things than other people and can pick up on energies and can pick up on cues and emotions and just, yeah, like the, it's, it gets very spiritual when you talk about that aspect of it, you know, and society doesn't want to believe in that, but that's, that's where society goes wrong. Cause these people know that these gifts exist, you know, and that they can exploit them, you know, and yeah. it's, it's very, very real. I've, I 100% believe that. And it absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so they're able to use that a lot in the project of different people for various things. I was used for remote viewing. And so we did a presentation for Hinckley on my ability to remote view. 
which means, uh, for people who aren't aware, means that I, I'm able to see things in what I would call the memory field. I call it the memory field, the energy field. It, it's a field of energy that exists around us all and it records everything that's happening. And if you're able to get in tune with that, you're able to watch it and see various things happening. I've had it uh, occur since I've remembered uh, my past back in 2017. I haven't remote viewed for a while, but I've been able to do it several times since then, which is interesting. I'm still working on that process and I don't have it down, you know, but when I was a mind slave uh, and under their control, they were able to, to hit me with that uh, pretty successfully. And so for Hinckley, I was able to um, view his wife because it was hard to convince Hinckley once again that I was truly even remote viewing. And so he said, well, how are you going to prove this? And my uncle said, well, let's view your wife. And so I viewed his wife and she was in church uh, down in uh, Utah. And I was able to tell him, uh, well, it was you know, interesting, because when I told him she was at church, he he said, well, duh, <laughs> she better be at church, you know, because that's where she was supposed to be. Um, but she had a certain kind of shawl. I don't know exactly what to call it uh, on. And it was a specific color. And I was able to tell him that. And and he knew when I talked about that, because that was a gift that he had actually given to her. And so that convinced him of the ability and the, the aptitude of remote viewing. And so as an elitist, you know, back to the satanic elite, they're able to learn these things. Like you were saying, you know, the general population, they're not even able to believe that these kinds of things can even be happening. But these people, they know and they want that secret knowledge and it's dark magic to them. And they're working at understanding it and having those keys given to them in order to do those things. And so I was going to be uh, moved to Salt Lake where I was going to be used by the church and the church leadership. I'm not exactly sure what for, but it doesn't seem good to me. Um, and so, yeah, does that make sense, Emma? Yes, thank you for sharing that. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. Just thinking about that childlike mind, you did a good job kind of putting yourself in your shoes as a child, you know, and it's so sad to think that you had to process all of that at such a quick time at such a young age, you know, just over and over and over again. It's just, it's unfathomable to think about, you know? Yeah. Ugh. yeah. And part of it with their programming, in my mind, I perceive that they even see themselves as being merciful because that you don't have to remember it. You're able to forget what just happened, but it still lingers under the surface. It's still there. It's just at the back of your mind behind a wall or several walls. Thresholds are a big part of it all, moving through that threshold and understanding what happened there. So, yeah. And then I was... Um, so that was when I was 15 years old that I was used in that presentation for Hinckley. I was about to turn 16. And that trip I was taking, or that, that year, so I met Hinckley that summer or that spring. That was in March, towards the end of March, beginning of April, that that happened, that I met Hinckley. And then I was sent to Disneyland uh, that summer for my last year of programming at the Disneyland Park. And so uh, that was a really bad summer. And then um, after programming at the Disneyland Park, I was taken back east with my grandparents. And that's when I met Charlie Pride, um, had a couple experiences with Bird, uh, saw Bird over there. Um, and that was the year that he bought me that he bought me as a slave, that he paid for me. And so that was a big year for me. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, Emma. It's all hard to talk about. I know. I appreciate you shining a light on this. It's it's horrific, you know. And then just thinking about again trying to process that as a child, it's like it's impossible to put yourself in those people's shoes. You know, it's like there's no empathy. It's just stripped from people, and it's so terrible to even try to comprehend, you know, what goes through these people's minds and to think about, you know, what, like the child you were, you know, and I just want to say, you know, little JR, I know he's proud of you for being up here today and talking about this and bringing justice to his story and, and empowering other people. Yeah. Yeah. He tried before to speak out, but they would, he'd get shut down pretty quick. But 95 was when I met Hinckley. And I want to say, Emma, that it was 93 that I was sold to the CIA. In 93. And that, that is when I was um, bought by Senator Byrd. And 93 was the last year that I went to Disneyland. Yeah. And Disneyland was a bad year that year. It was close to my birthday, um, going back to 93. And when I was in 93, yeah, when I met Gordon, oh, I'm trying to remember how old I was at all of these times. I'm sorry. It all gets a little bit jumbled, even for me, after working through it all. It's really difficult. Yeah, but Disneyland that year, um, that was a bad year. And that was the year that I learned that I was being sold to the CIA. And they let me know it uh, before, before I was. My uncle had talked to me about it. And, and so I was sold to Bird that year in 93. And uh, I became uh, an active CIA mind slave. Now, when you're a mind slave for the CIA, you have different levels of what you're going to be used for. And so I was used as a courier. I was used in porn. And then later, when I got older, I was used uh, as an assassin. I was used to get rid of people. And this is what I would call uh, my pe Pentagon level black operations experience because I was tested by Dick Cheney, uh, of, of all people, that son of a bitch. I hate that man. He is a terrible man. And he tested me uh, for my Pentagon level uh, black operations. And that took place in my hometown and was arranged through my grandfather. And for that, I was made to uh, murder a girl from my high school. They made me kill her. And yeah, it was an absolutely horrible experience because they had asked me, my grandfather had asked me, Emma, who out of everyone you know would you want to marry? And that is the girl that I was made to kill. It's all about completely twisting everything that you can ever imagine in one moment of time. And so Dick Cheney uh, did that test and that cleared me for Pentagon level operations. And the premise of that test was to prove that I would do anything that they told me to do. That is what that was about uh, for the reason that I just gave you, mm -hmm. that to have to do that to someone that you would want to be so close to you. It was a horrible. And that cleared me for my Pentagon level operations. So, and then I was used in Japan and I was used again in Haley. They tried to use me on an operation in Boise, uh, but that didn't go well. Something uh, for your listeners to understand, uh, which may sound odd, but um, the one drug, there's a lot of drugs, Emma, in the program and in the project. They constantly are feeding you drugs. They call them potions, back to the black magic concept. And they're constantly feeding you these drugs and they have different drugs for different purposes. One to wake you up, one to put you to sleep, 
one to make you angry, one to make you feel invincible, etc. One to mellow you out as well, yellow mellow. That's what we used to call that. And they would um, feed you drugs constantly. But the one drug you weren't allowed to have was marijuana. You were not allowed as a trauma-based mind slave to have marijuana. Now, not everyone in the project, let me rephrase that. Not everyone who is aware that you're in the project knows that. They don't all know or understand why you're not supposed to have that. Because I would acquire that from people even who knew that I was in the project, but they didn't completely understand what that was all about. But what that, that particular herb does is it disrupts your programming somehow. Somehow it, it, breaks, it breaks down the programming so that you're able to have logic and use your conscious mind and not lose your mind to them. It's difficult to explain. When I was in Boise and I was on the rooftop, my uncle had placed me there. I was uh, supposed to shoot a guy who was going to come out of a bar, the Neurolox. Yeah, I'd been in the bar, I'd seen the target, and I was um, positioned on a roof, Zion's Bank, actually. And Zion's Bank was well aware that the Central Intelligence Agency was using their bank. And they had uh, arranged it with Zion. Zion's is owned, it, that started as a Mormon company. You know, they don't want us using the term Mormon. We're supposed to call them Latter-day Saints. And that's all fine and dandy, but I always knew them as Mormons. And so that's a Mormon bank. And I was positioned on Zion's and I was supposed to eliminate the target when he came out of the bar at closing time. Well, my programming broke down. One reason it broke down was I'd been smoking marijuana with some friends of mine a couple nights before. I'm not sure exactly how long before. And just that one time uh, in that time frame was enough to break the programming enough to where it failed. And so I was up there on the roof. Now, when I'd been sent into the bar, so I had been sent into the bar and I had was supposed to lay eyes on the target. Now, Boise is where I grew up. I grew up in Nampa, just outside of Boise. And so I have friends in that area. And I went into the bar. And when I was leaving, after I ID'd the target and seen him, I went to leave. And my friends, one of my good friends, older sisters, was walking in the bar. And she was, she was a little schnocker. She was a little drunk. And she saw me. And we started talking. And I couldn't sneak out. I couldn't get away from her. And so we talked for a little while and she almost blew my cover, Emma, because I had a radio receiver in my ear, a device for listening and communicating with my uncle who was out in a van uh, outside of the building, a comms van. And so she almost blew my cover because she saw that comms device and she said, what are you? And she was so drunk, you know, the yeah, and she was just a little gal. And so it didn't take a whole lot. And but a sweetheart of a gal, you know. And so this really bothered my uncle that she almost blew our cover and that she had seen me at all, because now she had seen me in the bar. And so I was positioned up on the roof, and I was finally told, You are to not only eliminate the target, you're also to shoot your friend's sister, and you're supposed to shoot everyone else in front of the bar that you can hit with the ammo that you have in this weapon. And so I was supposed to basically commit a mass shooting was going to cover up this assassination. We were going to cover it up with a mass shooting. I don't know if they even gave a damn if I was caught in all of that. And my programming broke down through all of this. I was up there on the roof. I was freezing. It was cold. Uh, it was raining on me, the wind was blowing, and my programming started to break down. And my mind could process, you're about to shoot your friend's sister. Like this, something's wrong. And I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. It all broke down and I freaked out at my uncle who was below me in the van. They closed off the parking area underneath us 
on the building. The building, Zions, had its own parking lot. And a parking attendant was there making sure that no one would come up to that level. That level was closed off. My uncle was parked there in the van. And so we were working in conjunction with the bank. And my uncle, he got pissed when I got pissed because we started, you know, when I would be in those personalities, Emma, it was a different guy. Like I could be mean and, you know, fuck you, Gail. We got into this big argument about what was going on. And he said, you get down right now. You just get off the roof. And so I got off the roof. We aborted that operation. But that man didn't, didn't get to live. Uh, he was an individual from a foreign country. He was some kind of foreign national. And he, we ended up getting him in, um, in Haley, Idaho. He, he didn't, he survived that attempt, but we got him later. And so unfortunately, uh, his whole family went the second time. We were, I was made to, to eliminate not only him, Emma, but but everyone there in the house. And so, and that was, that's a terrible experience, a terrible thing to talk about. These are the kinds of things that they do. And that's why I'm so motivated, Emma, to talk about it with people because it's wrong. I'm sure that I have rambled and I apologize for that, but these things are wrong. The Central Intelligence Agency is sponsoring slavery and human trafficking, drug trafficking, and murder. And these things are wrong. And I'm a living witness to that. And I have tried to communicate this with law enforcement and government officials. And they've done nothing but harass me and try to keep me quiet. But I'm not gonna be quiet. Uh, for all the things that I've talked about, it's all wrong. And we as a people have to stand up and understand that these things are happening. I know it's really hard for people to even comprehend that these things can happen. I, I get that. And that's part, that's part of the mind science of it, is that it's difficult for the healthy human mind to even perceive that anyone could go to that level. It's so bad, but they do. And they are, and they do it to their own children and to other people's children. And if we don't do something, then I just can't be quiet about it. So I am, I'm against it. And all those people that are in it, they need to wake up. You know, not everyone who's in it even understands what they're involved with. Like we talked about earlier, my parents, they don't completely understand. Everyone does it, even those in the project, even Charlie Pride. Charlie, you know, I, I hate Charlie Pride. Like, I'm pissed at Charlie, but Charlie was messed up. And even Charlie wanted out. He wanted out. When I saw Charlie Pride, because I did, Emma, uh, I was raped by Charlie Pride in backstage. He was backstage. I was taken back there and I met him and he signed my and autographed my picture because I met him backstage. My cousin and I both did. And I had carried a message to Charlie from my uncle. And uh, he took that message with the key, which was the switchblade that I brought him. And he stuck it in my chest. And that's why my uncle had stuck the knife in my chest. I could put it in and that's how you take the message out. That was the key to it. And so Charlie, he tortured me for a little while and he raped my cousin and I. And he was not a good man. But when we first walked in the room, Charlie was sitting at his desk and he was writing there in his waiting room in behind stage, you know, whatever we call it. And he was sitting there writing a letter. And so here I am carrying this secret message in my mind well, Charlie was sitting there writing a letter to Bird, and this this letter was saying, "I want out of all this. You know, this stuff is. I'm done. I don't want to do this stuff anymore. I know that because Bird told me that when I saw him 
a little while later because the next man in the project I can remember seeing uh, in the following day or days was Bird. I met him at a memorial. And so, and I gave, I gave Bird that letter that Charlie was writing and Charlie wanted out, but Bird wouldn't let him out. You know, he was a slave too. And so it's sad. All these folks are all caught up in it, but there is hope for us. There's hope for humanity. More and more people are learning about this stuff and more and more survivors are able to work through it and able to come out and talk about it. And I don't think that they can stop it. You know, they're, Kathy O'Brien has a good way of defining them. They're linear thinkers. They are. They are linear thinkers. And that's helped keep me alive, to be honest, about that. They are, are such linear thinkers that, yeah, it, you just have to know what they're doing. And so... But God's also helped keep me alive, Emma. I give a lot of credit to God in all of this. Because without God, I'd be dead. If God didn't want this message being communicated, then I would be dead. And that's just how it would be. They've tried that several times, you know, to ensure that. It was most dangerous when I first started to remember. They tried to kill me several times. And, and that was nerve wracking. We'll just put it that way. But those are things that I was made to do. And so part of it is I was able to see it and to understand that it was coming and to be able to face that fact. And part of it was God stepping in. Because there were some times, Emma, when I remember one time in particular, I was dead to rights. There was a gunman and we were sitting in a restaurant. And I knew he was there to kill me. And I was armed. I'd gone out and I'd gotten my handgun and I'd put it under my clothes because I had to do everything I could. But I knew that if this guy was able to do what he intended, that that would have been it. And God stepped in and the circumstances weren't perfect for them to kill me on that day. Part of it, you know, a lot of people are interested in that. That's one of the reasons I'm talking about it. I've been asked, well, how can you stay alive? You have the government after you. You're dead. It's a sensitive thing for the Central Intelligence Agency or the Mormon Church or those affiliated with them to, to get rid of you. Because if they don't do it right, they can get caught. And that exposes everything. And so the more I've talked about this, the safer I am. Because if they whack me now, well, now they have proven their story. So I thank God for all of his help in all of that. And for everyone's help. There's been a lot of support in the community and in the world. And I appreciate that. And so, but. Uh, Humanity has hope. So, God bless you. That was such a uplifting message to sort of follow so many dark things, you know, because this stuff does get dark. And for people, whether they're they've been digging in deep for a while or whether they're new to it, you know, this stuff has the the low frequency to kind of suck your hope out of you and to just think, gosh, there's nothing, you know, there's no hope. Like we're screwed and the world is a dark place and it's hell on earth. And, you know, realizing that that's exactly what they want us to think, you know, they want us on a low frequency and not realizing how beautiful this world is and, and our, our powers of creating, you know, an, an even better world by coming together and taking the gifts that they're trying to exploit and using them for something good you know, creation, creating our, creating our way out of a bad world and creating the world that we wish we lived in, you know, and it's such a great message to remind people of that because we do have all the power. It's them that don't, you know, they're weak cowards who gaslight us into feeling powerless and their worst fear is to realize, or is for us to realize that we're being gaslit and to say, uh, -uh I'm not, I'm not tolerating that anymore. I'm done with your abuse. I'm taking my power back. And I am going to do something amazing in this world, you know, and create something that is going to 
uh, elevate humanity instead of perpetuating the abuse over and over again, you know? So I really appreciate everything that you do and the messages, you know, the stuff is really hard and somehow you find a way to make it somewhat lighthearted to where it's digestible for people. And I really appreciate your way of breaking everything down to JR. So thank you. Nice. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, it is difficult to process. So, yeah. Well, I'd love to have you back on. I know we're getting up to the two hour mark and I want to be respectful of your time. I know that we could probably talk about a million other things. I wanted to see if there was anything else that you did want to cover before we maybe wrap up and to to let you know that I would love to have you back for another discussion um, to dive into some some more of your experiences and, and some more education. Nice. Thank you, Emma. I think we've covered everything for today. Yeah. And we can talk about that. That would be good. Yeah. It's nice to let people know. So. Absolutely. And can you talk just a little bit before we get off? Can you talk just a little bit about if you're on any other social media besides your blog and then maybe give people just a little synopsis of your blog and remind them of where they can find that? Because I want people to support the work that you're doing also. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so my blog, mormonmonarch.com, I call it my website. Um, that's where I put my book, essentially. And so, and you can find that under writings on past. And those are all um, journaled memories that I have uh, worked through. And most of them, we're talking months and years to work through these things. And so I tried to work through as many as I can. I've taken a break from it um, lately because you need a break once in a while. And so I will take breaks from it. But what I do is I gain the best understanding that I can of those events. And in my mind, the most important thing to share, I can say whatever I want, but what I remember is so important because that is what they're doing. And so I can say, for example, they're Satanists. Well, why? And through my writings, I explain why, through what I remember of, of living and working with these people and, and being made to be a trauma-based mind slave. And so my writings also, they, I will write something out and if I remember something that adds to the context of that writing, I come back to it. And so uh, Disneyland or my meeting with Hinckley, any of those things, if, if one day it comes back to me, oh, well, this happened as well, then I work on journaling that and then I edit and adjust those memories accordingly. And what I'm working on is I'm going to uh, put a book together. So those are all chapters of a book. And I will have that book published at some time in the near future. Yeah, because if if something does happen to me, let's say I my heart stops beating for some reason, then a book is a hard copy that can live on and other people can read it for generations and it can be passed on. A website is something that's more vulnerable. A website, uh, it runs in its course until its, sub its uh, subscription is paid. And so I will be publishing a book because I feel like it, this information is important for humanity, just for the people to know it and to be able to remember it for generations and understand it. And I feel like it's gonna take Emma generations for people to understand this thing completely and for it to work its way through our, our social structure. But I pray that it does. And so, and I'm also on Facebook. Um, I've been on Twitter before, but I'm not on there right now. I, yeah, I still, I'm a multiple. And so sometimes I'll start a social media thing and then I get rid of it <laughs> I'm trying to be more stable so, yeah 
Wonderful. I'm going to link all of that. And if there's any other links that you think of or any specific article pages that you want me specifically to link that maybe can add context, you can send it to me and I'll, I always try to do an extensive show notes where people can just go click on all your links. So I encourage people to go follow and support JR. You know, this content, none of it gets elevated in the algorithms. There's nobody trying to help get the word out on this except us. You know, it takes you on the other side saying, I'm going to go visit this website or I'm going to share this interview. I'm going to watch it all the way through. And then I'm going to go share it with somebody else somehow, you know, so we have to be the boots on the ground, spreading the word about this. And I would love for all of you guys to go share JR's story, to go support his blog. JR, I'd love to have you back on, like I said, especially to help promote your book. So let's definitely get you back on uh, also, whenever you do that, that way we can drive some traffic there and, and you can talk about it a little bit, but that's really exciting too. So we'll have something to look forward to you creating in the near future. So you guys, thank you so much for tuning in, JR. Thank you for being here. God bless you thank all. You, and we'll see you guys next week.